Hello, and welcome to the Inside EVs podcast for May the 29th, 2020. This is episode number eight. Today, among other things, we'll be talking about Tesla slashing its prices, Rivian resuming work on its factory, and a Tesla Model 3 is heading for Pikes Peak. I'm Dominic Yoni, Inside EVs editor and Inside EVs forum moderator. Joining us today, we have Tom Logney, EV advocate, multiple EV owner and Inside EVs editor. We also have Martin Lee from the EV News Daily podcast, available on all your usual podcast platforms. Uh, additionally, we have Kyle Connor from Out of Spec Motoring and One Lap YouTube channels. He also puts together super awesome videos for the new Inside EVs YouTube channel. Uh, go go subscribe and tap that notification bell. And as you can see, at least uh, you can if you're watching us on our YouTube live, live stream right now, we have some special guests with us. So I'd like to welcome uh, Zach and Jesse from the Now You Know YouTube channel, where they talk about electric vehicles and sustainability with, I think it's fair to say, an emphasis on Tesla. And they have with them Blake Fuller. Uh, Blake has a has had a long career in the battery business, and he also has a passion for racing cars up mountains. And he set the record for production electric cars on Pikes Peak in 2016, recording a time of 11 minutes and 48.264 seconds in a Tesla Model S P90D, beating the old record by about a minute. And then finally, we have EV Dave with us, who is the sponsor of. Uh, a new Pikes Peak effort and who d donated the car for it. And so, all right, well, we are streaming live on YouTube, which means if you're watching us right now, you can ask questions or leave comments via the YouTube chat. So welcome gentlemen of the panel and ladies and gentlemen of the audience. We have lots to talk about today. Um, so uh, this kick off with some news real quick so we can get talking about uh, the good stuff. So um, not that this isn't good stuff because Tesla has just discounted, discounted uh, some of its prices uh, up to 5% on uh, 5 6.25% on the long range Model S. That's a $5,000 savings. And the Model X is also $5,000 cheaper, a Model 3. But before you could get the, um, the standard range plus for like 39 something. Now $2,000 off is $37,990. Tom, what do you think about this? So, you know, uh, good move for Tesla. Uh, if they can do it, if it if it works for them, you know, uh, it, it makes the cars more uh, reachable, more affordable. Uh, there's obviously a Q2 push right now because of, you know, the COVID-19 shutdowns. It's affected everything. Everybody's uh, bottom lines are going to look disastrous in this quarter. It's part of the reason why Elon's kind of putting the pressure on people to buy full self-driving package, now saying the price was going to raise uh, after July 1st, which, you know, not coincidentally begins uh, a third quarter. Uh, so, you know, Tesla's just trying to make that final push, which they often do uh, at the end of a quarter to, you know, make the books look as, as good as they can. Good thing for consumers, uh, you know, and, um, you know, I, I the only negative down part is, you know, we're starting to see all these tweets now and people comment, geez, I just bought one last month and, you know, am I going to get a refund? You know, with car dealerships, the dealers lower raise prices all the time. You know, yeah. somebody can walk into a dealership and buy a car for 5000 less than you did 15 minutes after you left the dealership. That's just the way it goes. So I, I don't really have too much patience for people complaining that they just bought a Tesla and a couple of days later, the price dropped. Uh, take your car, enjoy it. It's a great car. Don't complain. Because this does affect resale value. Say you just bought a car and it, you know, it depreciates usually a little bit, but then uh, like the way the Tesla's prices are set automatically across the board that, so now it's, it's um, depreciated like $2,000 right off the, right off the bat. So I, I guess there's some people a little, you know, prickly about that, but what do you think about this, uh, Kyle? Oh, we can't hear you, Kyle. Maybe we have a, a few sound adjustments. Sorry, I think it was all muted. Can you hear me there now? You go. There we there go. We Sorry about you. that. Uh, 
I think it's never a bad thing where you're getting a really cool product for a less price. I mean, if you look at, for example, uh, like a Model S P100D when I bought mine, granted, I had a huge showroom adjustment on it, but it was 164,000 sticker. Uh, which is just insane. Now you can buy a way better car, Raven, all the cool new stuff, and it's 110, 115. Like it, like it's pretty crazy. And now it's even less. So I just think um, you know the the Model S and X are getting old, no question, from a technological standpoint. Model Three and Y have next generation hardware. Uh, you know, I, I think there needs to be a closer uh, price spread between the cars. Or um, and and I think we're leading up to seeing some really cool things with S and X. I'm excited for Battery Day, but they definitely need some upgrades. I mean, the the crazy thing is your top trim cars cannot even accept uh, 250 kilowatt charging right now. Right. So you have your your best road trip, your fastest charging and the best Tesla you can buy can't do any of that. So, um, yeah, I, I think it's uh, justified that they lowered the price. Hopefully it'll spark some demand and use up uh, or, or sell some Model S and X that are out there currently. But I still think a lot of people are going to wait for updated versions. So uh, some people have uh, said that they've done this to juice demand. Like there's may maybe there's not like not a lot of demand for the cars now because of the COVID situation. But uh, I, I know if we asked Elon, he would probably say, well, there's, you know, we've now achieved a, a good a bit of gross margin on the car. So we're reducing it, you know, the price so we can sell more to more people, make it more available. So Zach, can I put you on the spot and ask you your opinion about this? Yeah, I think uh, Kyle kind of hit on it. Everyone kind of knows that something's going on with Battery Day. And I think that uh, if you were in the market for a Model S or X, you kind of been holding off because you're like, well, something's coming. I mean, we get emails all the time like, what's what's going on, Tesla? What are they going to release? We don't know. But I think this has something to do with the new battery. So I think this was it. Yeah, you got to lower the price enough to entice people in because they're all just sitting on the sidelines right now. Right. Clear out whatever's left. Um, Dave, you own an S, X, and 3, don't you? I do. And, and a, a Y. And a Y as well. Yeah, yeah. that's correct. Wow. So do you feel that the S and X are last gen tech compared to the 3 or Y? What's your opinion? Um, well, I originally bought a Model X uh, in 2017, and uh, I since gave that to my daughter, and uh, all for the reason so I could buy a, a 2020 Model X. I bought it with free supercharging as a as a, something I use all the time because I put fifty thousand miles in a couple of years on these cars. So, but as far as driving, dang, I'll tell you, the Model Y uh, is really an awesome car to drive. But the Model X still holds its own with all of the features it has, such as towing and the suspension. If you want a really road car, you want a Model X or a Model S. Yeah, just because of that Raven dampening adjustment, it makes a huge difference, especially in X more than S, I would say. that That's correct. And having the Raven drive allows you one pedal complete stop, just like the Model 3. Right, because you have that now. permanent magnet motor. That, that is can right. Do it. And that is a really great feature. Yeah, I agree. I think uh, that, that probably hits it on the head. I think if you're cruising around and you're just a normal consumer and maybe you don't care about fastest technology or packaging and you just want a comfortable car the snx still makes sense for a lot of people that just want a comfortable car to cruise around in right i mean we were driving down here um you know it was a 12 hour trip and in a model 3 long range model 3 long range 2017 right early car and um the range on it it's too much i'm sorry <laughs> i like, agree my is. bladder at the end <laughs> you're just like oh like you know we were so used to you know like 200 ish miles and then when we put on the uh you know we, we went for a trip with the with a trailer and you know you're stopping every 90 miles yeah <laughs> getting your on charge. a good stretch right <laughs> and uh oh boy like i'm i would honestly be a little worried to be getting you know a car with such a big range <laughs> yeah know, for doing road trips you're gonna want to stop more frequently you're absolutely right yeah, yeah I, I think it uh big batteries are, are my only biggest benefit to having a large battery in a car is you can really get more juice at peak charging rates. Absolutely. Um, so like, uh, for example, 
Model 3 long range used to taper, do 150 kilowatt to like 54%. Now it tapers at 34, but still getting a 54% charge at max charging rate was badass. That mm-hmm. was great. Um, the standard pluses can peak, but they they go down. Mm-hmm. But I agree on a full charge, like your initial, let's leave the house at 100% yeah. charge. That stretch sucks every time because <laughs> it just goes on forever. It's right. like, can we find a supercharger already? Right. Yeah. So. Yeah, you really welcome superchargers to go uh, and do your business mm-hmm. every couple hundred miles. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. So sorry to sidetrack us there, guys. No, that's fine. So uh, let's just move along real quick. Uh, so the Rivian has reopened its its operations there and is back to fixing up its factory in Normal, Illinois. Uh, I'm not sure if you've seen this. It looks like we're now looking at a two month delay, probably for the R1T. Uh, that's the electric pickup truck, which I think is probably like the most most anticipated product, uh, electric vehicle product that doesn't have like a, a Tesla name on it. I think maybe Cybertruck is probably stole some of its, some of its thunder, but the Rivian R1 T is still a pretty awesome looking vehicle, and a lot of people looking forward to it. Um, have you guys seen this news, uh, Martin? Yeah, and good luck to uh, to everyone getting back to whatever the new uh, normal, pardon the pun, uh, is with this post virus uh, virus world. You know, it's kind of funny on the podcast uh, on the EV News Daily podcast this week. We do a question of the week, and listeners email in. And actually, from a, a, a European UK perspective, the question I'm asking this week is: What do you want from a truck? To try and understand, uh, because about forty percent of my audience are in the in the US, and then the rest is kind of split Europe and mo- kind of mostly Europe. Then. Um, and it's really interesting, the comments coming in, and there's so much love for Rivian, as well as Cybertruck as well. But really, it is, from a from a perspective of, of European, people are talking about, well, we want it to be, uh, I can use it for work, and a few Aussies as well, talking about how it needs to be kind of fit for, you know, the if whatever that they do with the Rivian, make sure that it can, uh, you know, you can go to the middle of the forest and, and run your work tools off it and all of those kind of things. And actually... Uh, the U.S. responses I'm getting are reminding me of this kind of cultural difference that we have, where actually people want like five or six comfortable seats and long range and be able to road trip in it. And the idea, like you should see the trucks that we drive on the road here, they're just, you, you wouldn't want to do a road trip in them. They're, they're working vehicles. And so uh, the Rivian is an interesting one because it, it, it seems to be trying to do all of the above and hit all of those target markets as well in a very conventional styling truck as well. So that's you know that's the European perspective is is we kind of we view them more as well. You maybe you have one as a work car or a business car that's parked up at the weekends, whereas it seems like it's a one eighty shift in the US. Like you're thinking at the weekend, right? We want the Rivian to be able to tow the boat and the caravan or the trailer, and it's like leisure activities. Am I reading that right? Yeah, I mean it's adventure oriented. Have have you seen this in person, Jesse? The R one T. Yeah, the uh, R one T. I mean, obviously not a not one that I could get, you know sit in and drive, but uh, yeah, I mean it's a good size. Uh, the bed's a little small for people who want to do, but honestly, the bed is too big on most pickup trucks. It's it's one hundred percent too big on on most pickup trucks for ninety nine percent of the time. So, um, you know, it doesn't to me as a non pickup truck driver, like, uh, <laughs> you know, whatever. Um, it definitely looks like it's going to be a very popular, uh, design. It's just a matter of price. I think it's going to be the biggest question to me, um, whether people are going to be willing to pay that. I think that they probably will pickup trucks are generally more expensive. And, uh, you know, as Americans, you know, it's not so much about the, you know, pulling the boat and stuff it's just you're driving it every day for yeah, whatever reason you're cruising around north carolina you're going to lower <laughs> the rear suspension jack up the front get the carolina squat going as we call it and uh <laughs> but I, you know i'm more excited about the r1s than the t mm. personally i think that's going to be like the ultimate soccer mom car cruising around new england towns right i mean i could see this go up to vermont for the weekend in the rivian i mean what do you do you guys see that that same vision it has the right look yeah the cyber truck i mean has all the utility it's a very utilitarian truck and and um i don't know we sat in the cyber truck and it's a six seater and i think that gets overlooked a lot it's, it's a comfy and like, it's massive it's massive it is massive, massive. Yeah. like you can hang a chandelier from the roof but like it, <laughs> right but again the the look i think is it's what's going to be the the real dividing line is is some people are just gonna uh, 
disregard the Cybertruck for its for its appearance. Yeah, well, I, I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing because it's a right. conversation piece. It allows people who really like it to show it off. No, but I think there's a place for the Rivian to be sort of like a Range Rover replacement. And I think that it, if, if it could take that market, um, that would be just such a big plus because Huge. Range Rovers are the dirt of some of the dirtiest cars on the road yeah i mean like 10 miles per gallon on a good day they're yeah. fantastic to drive don't get me wrong very capable i'm a huge fan but the just it, it's just unnecessary they either need to make a full electric range rover which i'd reviewed the plug-in hybrid that they did for inside evs and it was okay but it needs a full ev drivetrain yeah and it needs to be able to do a tank turn yeah, a tank soccer turn. Mom, that is that's the right. one thing when I talk to soccer moms, they're always asking for it. Gee, right. oh, I want to do a tank turn. <laughs> tank turn. But you know what? That would be so useful. Just yeah. imagine parallel parking and getting it in. I mean, you just. Totally. Oh, I can't wait for that. Yeah. Right on. So let's move along away from Rivian real quick to uh, Mercedes Benz. They've started sales now of the EQV 300 with the big 100 kilowatt hour battery. Uh, I believe this is just in Europe, but it's like a 250 miles of range in this thing. It's like a luxury minivan. Like it's, the, it's like the Rolls Royce of minivans or the Mercedes of minivans. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> so yeah, but it's like 71,388 euros and uh, that's like $78,000 um, uh, US, which includes like 19% tax sales, their sales tax, their value added tax, which is like a sales tax is that's already in there, but that's still pricey. And so what, what do you get for that, Tom? So this is clearly aimed at the commercial market. I don't. I don't think too many families are going to be, you know, dumping. Uh, it's like uh, seventy-eight thousand after the value added tax uh, on on this van. But but for companies and for commercial purposes, it's going to work and it's going to work great. I mean, every time I go to Europe, particularly Germany, for on a press media event where for Volkswagen or BMW or Mercedes. Everybody gets shuttled around in these big vans. And you know what? The drivers typically leave the thing running all the time, especially when it's in the summer. They have air conditioning on. They want the van to be nice and cool when, when everybody gets back into it. And it's, it, it's maddening that they could be sitting out there just letting it run and run and run just to keep it cool. This works out perfectly for, for, for that use case. And it's going to save over the course of time, even if they spend – you know, 20, 30,000 more on the van up front uh, over the years with the refueling and, uh, and maintenance savings, this is going to be a, a home run and uh, it's going to provide a, a nicer, quieter, smoother driving experience for the passengers. I see all the hotels getting these, the airport shuttles, uh, taxi services. Uh, you know, it's, it's an expensive vehicle, but you know, the, the bean counters are, are going to roll the numbers and say that, hey, you know, in three years or four years or whatever it is, we, we break even. And then after that, it's all gravy. Uh, you know, you mentioned it has a 100 kilowatt hour battery. 90 kilowatt hours is usable. Uh, and the, and the, the projected range is 250, 260 miles. But that was on the NEDC rating. Oh, so it's probably going to be a little bit less, but still yeah. 200 miles. That's more than what. The, the, this type of a vehicle will need for a day's driving. Uh, AC charging, it'll charge at 11 kilowatts. So the hotel or wherever can just come and plug in at night when, when, when the vehicle's not in service. It won't even need to DC fast charge. It, and when it does, it comes standard with only, a hunt, with only a 50 kilowatt DC fast charging capability. That's a little weak, but for an option, you can get 110 kilowatt DC fast charging. You know, I just I don't know if that's going to be necessary for most of these vehicles for their use case. I don't think they're going to be in such constant service that they're going to need to DC fast charge. Now, some of them will for some use cases. But, you know, what I'm thinking about airport shuttles and and um, and hotels, th these vehicles are going to sit for a good portion of the day and they could be on uh, you know AC charging while they're doing that. So. I think it's a great van. I, I wish we had something like that here in the U.S. And what I love about it is that we're now we're starting to get EVs in all shapes and sizes. True. It's not just these little hatchbacks that go 80 miles, which is what we had, you know, seven or eight years ago, other than Tesla, of course, of course. But now we're getting, you know, sports cars with the Porsche Taycan. And now we're getting big vans to move people around in. And I think that's really important for electric vehicle proliferation 
is going to be getting things in all shapes and sizes, and that's finally starting to happen, which really has me excited. Yeah, I'd like to just, uh, just to back up where what Tom said about total cost of ownership, and I've done some work with uh, fleets before, and and they make their decision with their head, not their heart. And there is, you know, five percent of that comes in that it's a Mercedes Benz, and if they are ferrying around uh, the kind of client that wants to be seen in a, in a Merc, then that will come into it. Maybe the badge on the front a little bit, but apart from that, it's ninety five percent decision made on TCO, and if they're going to do that on a three year lease. What, what are they going to replace? Wiper blades and tires, right? There's no maintenance. There's no diesel. You, you know, a, a, whatever a tank of diesel at our price is, I can't do the conversion for you. Sorry, but it's about, it's like pound twenty, which is like $1.50 uh, for a litre. Uh, I don't even know what that is in gallons. But, um, you know, that's probably 100 or £120 to fill up with diesel. And you'll go through that in no time at all if you're doing, in, doing a work run uh, or an airport run or something uh, down the motorway. And actually, you'll look at your total cost of ownership. This is a, a vehicle uh, that, you know, we talk about million-mile batteries, which is just a, a, like a vanity number with, with personal transport. It means nothing to... Uh, to uh, the you know the battery will last a million mile battery would outlast the metal of the car by a, a factor of three or four do you know what i mean but um these vehicles genuinely can do a million miles because if they're not moving they're not earning money and so when people start getting in evs to go to the airport or or they get picked up to get shuttled here or whatever and they're like this is quiet and the driver says yeah it's electric and they start talking and it's comfortable it's it you know so many more people get to experience EVs this way. And we all know on this podcast that what is that light bulb moment? We can talk to people all day about electric cars. The second someone drives one or is a passenger, they're like, I get it. Yes. Right. <laughs> How do I buy one? So I think it's really, these are really important vehicles. Yeah. Especially with the, the higher range, because range anxiety is the one thing that people are like, well, it's nice, but oh, the range, I, I guess I can, uh, I can just not buy one. Yeah, you need to need to have 200 miles now, at least like a vehicle like this in in 2020, you have to have at least 200 miles and 250. I don't know, any, any EDC, that's, man, man, it's, I wish it was <laughs> one, one schedule for, for range estimations, but, but anyway, so I wanted to talk about Ferris's energy doing an IPO, it was like a $480 million deal and Daimler could be in on it, but we, Something else came up this, on this morning news I thought we'd hit instead. Um, so we want to know where is the leaf? Uh, <laughs> Nissan put out a, a video and of their future electric vehicles uh, or future vehicles. And you can see the, actually the, the new Z is there on the end, the new sports car. Our, our, our friends over at Motor One are pretty excited about that. And I'm pretty excited about the Aria, which shows up in this video. But what doesn't show up is the Nissan Leaf, or actually, and the NV is it the NV two hundred the, the van that's not there as well. And both of those are older products on an older uh, powertrain with the air cooled batteries. So, does it look like the end of the road, Zach? Well, what do you think about this? Yeah, you guys had a Leaf, didn't you? Yeah, oh, we yeah. got we got two Leafs in the family. I mean, the problem is that they're they don't there's no battery management to. to you know that they're, they're air cooled batteries and, and uh they're starting to fade yeah you know you're like right and i mean I, we have older ones so i know that there are the the newer leafs that have actually a, a fairly decent range um and i mean i think that they're they're great vehicles they work very well for some people um they don't have the quite the charging i mean there was leaf was is it leaf gate battery gate what is it called yeah it was called oh goodness what was it fast charge gate anyway but the fast ENVs, charge. the vans yeah. were liquid cooled. Yeah. Rapid gate. Thanks, Rapid Tom. Yes, Thank I always I'm like oh, so many gates. And then, um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, the yeah, the EV, uh, the, the the vans were pretty cool, especially because you know most most vans don't need that far to go. And they would do vehicle to grid. Did you see yeah. some of those installs in Norway? They yeah. had like twelve of them lined up, and they would balance out the grid frequency with it. it was really cool. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, it, I would be sad to see the Leaf go, but um, if, if it's being replaced by much better vehicles, then, then I wouldn't be quite as, as sad, especially since they're going to be sticking around as used vehicles for quite a while. 
Right. But we got these guys on the smart car trend now. So oh, yeah. everyone knows how much I love my electric smart car and they were out there ripping it around. So I think oh, yeah. I convinced Jesse to say, you know what, this was better than his leaf. It's rear wheel drive. I mean, yeah. it is better than the leaf. There yeah. we go. <laughs> what, what part of the country do you guys live in, uh, Zach and Jesse? Uh, Northeast. Yeah, we're up near Boston. Oh, okay. For some, for some reason, I was thinking that you're like in Arizona. I don't know why. But okay, so you're leaving. You know, about the hot yeah. weather. Yeah. In my deep dark tan or something. <laughs> <laughs> so you don't have to worry about the, 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 uh, the heat scorching the battery on you then. Quite as much, although summers have been getting warmer. Yeah, you know. it's true. It's true. So, so, so we have you guys on the show today, and apparently, so Blake, we haven't spoken with you much yet. You're going to be driving um, a Tesla Model Three up Pikes Peak. Um, when is that race? Yeah. So the and actually, thanks to the three gentlemen sitting together in the room, there uh, is why we have this opportunity to actually drive the Model Three. It's the race is going to be August thirtieth this year. Okay. It typically is held in the end of June. For a long time, it was July fourth weekend, um, but now because of COVID, it's been pushed all the way into August thirtieth. So. Um, fingers crossed, everything's still going to run. Uh, we also had another event that was planned in July, another history making event, uh, but that's been pushed to next year. So uh, August 30th is the date of the, of the race, but we actually go out about a week and a half earlier uh, to start doing testing out there, plus to acclimate because the race starts at 9,000 feet, ends at 14,000 feet. And uh, most of us on the East Coast here are not used to the altitude. So we got to make sure we're ready. Yeah, that's a, that's a heck of a mountain. I think I was there in 2016, the year the Drive EO, the Latvian car won the race, and the, uh, Tsujima-san and, and Rimac had a vehicle as well, I think, that came in second in the electric. So uh, I'm familiar, it's just such an impressive and just incredible event and, and the place. It's you really have, If you have, ever have a chance to go, man, I cannot. I encourage you enough to take that opportunity. It's so incredible. So, so you've run this before already, Blake. Setting the record. There's your your go go puck car with us sitting on the bags of ice, chilling down. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was getting a nice little ice massage before it went to go. Uh, you know, perform for the day. <laughs> getting right. nice, and nice and tight. <laughs> so you're not going to have this pro this issue on the Model Three, do you think? Uh. Right now, we shouldn't. Well, I know we're not going to have the same level of, of thermal issues that we had with the Model S. And a lot of the, the Model S thermal issues we were running into were basically safety and longevity firmware issues, meaning that we had done a lot of testing prior to understand how to drive the car so that we could maximize what was the mechanical cooling system of the car. We're going to have to find out. I mean, that's that's part of why we're testing. And because of COVID, our testing schedule got pushed back about three months. So it was a, a welcome news that we had the race get pushed back two months. It, it kept us closer to our schedule. Right. And sorry to interrupt, but we should make it. So Blake and everyone here, we're all at the out of spec track for people who haven't watched. And uh, we have a two mile long road course research facility. So basically yesterday they were out there ripping around, drifting, getting some cool shots. Blake can learn the chassis in the car in an open environment. Uh, and then today we're going to do some more thermal testing. So Blake, can you share what the goal is going to be for today's activities? Well, let me check the schedule here. All right. <laughs> I see, I see uh, things we've got to knock out. So anybody who's driven a Model 3 on track also knows that one of the biggest things to address is the braking on the car. So we're going to be improving the braking today with better pads and fluid um, just so that we can be able to stretch the straightaways longer, brake harder at the end, um, and then also be able to push the thermal limits. The other thing that we're really – um, looking forward to today is we're finally going to get a set of our compound tires on there that are close to the spec that will be used for Pikes Peak. It is exactly the same tire that I ran in 2016, the Toyo R888. So I went with that as a baseline tire for the Model 3 to kind of keep it as an even playing field and uh, similar width on them as well. So we're going to start gathering data on how basically can the car run 12 to 15 minutes around the track at full tilt uh, without it getting into a point where I'm significantly seeing it pull back the amount of power it's giving. And one of the nice things is that 
we have two systems that are tied to the to the car. One is we have the Scan My Tesla app that we're utilizing with um, the OBD Link connector into the CAN harness, and then we also um, AEM, which is Advanced uh, Engine Management. They have an AEM EV division that they launched at SEMA this year, which is super exciting because when I see traditional internal combustion standalone engine management companies stepping into the EV space, which Cosworth, Motec, and others have done as well, but AEM. Um, have stepped up and helped sponsor the car to provide uh, their vehicle diagnostic module, their GPS sensors. We're going to be doing a lot of telemetry. So this is the first install of trying to tie the CAN channels to the AM dash. So if anybody's watching this and you are a CAN expert or software expert, please reach out to the team because that is not my role. I'm a little bit better behind the steering wheel than I am behind the keyboard. So definitely we need some help in that area to um, try to identify some of the channels for the CAN and to be able to get this going. But this is a this is a community effort. I'll let maybe Zach and Jesse and others speak to this, or even Dave, about the support for the community of this car. But for us, it's not only are we there to make history and open up, you know, people's eyes to what these cars can do, but it's about as we're learning the information about the car, sharing with others, and educating what I consider to be a new breed of enthusiasts. I mean, there's just so much passion surrounding. Uh, the Tesla community and uh, even electric vehicle owners in general that they want to know more about their cars and, it, and, it's, and they're very tech specific, meaning that before EVs came to market, you start talking about a kilowatt hour battery pack and, you know, unless they're looking at their electric bill, they didn't really care. But that level of kind of detail and, and orientation is something that now there's interest in, oh, well, what tires should I run? <laughs> what, what brakes do you run? How, how do you make that car handle so well? You know, I mean, when I, when I took, um, a few other YouTubers for rides around Coda in my Model S, they were like, holy crap, I did not know this car could handle like this. They know it can accelerate quickly, <laughs> but um, I, sometimes the handling of the cars is overlooked. Yeah, well, we met Blake in uh, Austin, Texas in February. He said, like, I'd like to go up again in a Model 3. And Jesse and I are like, great, we know nothing about racing teams, so let's do it. <laughs> and uh, then we got Dave here to uh, become part of the team. So he donated the car, and then we've got community sponsors on the car. So I think this is the first time that a community sponsored car is going to be attacking Pike's Peak. And that's really special to us because instead of like Pennzoil or some giant corporation, it's the community that wants to see this car win. Right. And so we're actually putting people's names on the car. So just, you know, if, if people want to help support us, they get their name on the car, just like if it was, you know, Kellogg's Corn Flakes, um, <laughs> which is, it is really nice because it, it's nice to have this community um, that is so willing to support something that they care about. So, so when did, when did this all come together? It sounds like it maybe at the fully charged uh, thing in Austin, Texas. Maybe what's what's the, what's the genesis of the project? Yeah, I mean, basically, I mean, uh, it was um, yeah. Blake had messaged us uh, before we had left for Austin. He said, you know, like, hey, do you want to see the car that raced at Pikes Peak? Um, and luckily, I was like. Wait, is this the guy that we saw in 2016? <laughs> so I did, you know, I did a little googling, and I was like, oh my gosh, this is this is the guy. And I was like, yeah, of course, we'd love to meet you. Um, and so, yeah, Blake drove out um, as, at the supercharger stations along the way from Florida to Austin. He was installing a roll cage. Um, he had so in the back of his car, he had the roll cage all disassembled. He was assembling it on the way there. I don't know when you were sleeping, and then you were putting the tires on. You know that day. Um, just so that way we could get some some time on on the track. It was one of the the few times we could get a, an electric car going around Coda at, at fully charged live, and um, yeah, we were just like we were so blown away by uh, his his pedigree of of, of racing and also uh, what we saw while we were there, and we were just like, you know. It's it's ridiculous that there hasn't been another Tesla to go up Pike's Peak. It's 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 one of the it's going to be a great example of for the future of like wow these vehicles can actually compete. So EV Dave, how did you get involved with the project? I mean, you're giving them the car for this. I get I guess you get it back afterwards with uh, all the uh, extra um, roll cage and doodads added onto it. Yeah, that's the plan anyway. Um, uh, my goal in all of this is to uh, bring awareness to electric vehicles. And uh, I was in a position to uh, provide the car to uh, Blake and Zach and Jesse here to help promote the uh, uh, EV uh, technology and uh, prove again that uh, the EVs could uh, do a good job 
and in this case, uh, make it up Pikes Peak and hopefully uh, get the record for this year uh, for a production EV. And uh, that's really my goal is just to uh, make it awareness to everybody. I mean, we go through uh, weeks and every once in a while somebody goes, man, I never even knew that it would do this. And, you know, it's that moment that makes you feel good because you actually be able to provide the car and uh, they don't realize it. Uh, I raced the Model 3 um, in autocross. And if you guys don't know, autocross is a local uh, car club thing where they go up and set monthly and you set up a bunch of cones and race it around the track. Uh, last year we were in B Street and uh, this year now we're in Super Street because we kicked all the B Street people uh, with our stock Tesla. So, <laughs> if, so that's stock how tires, I guess. You know? I'm sorry? You stock tires also? Absolutely stock. Wow. Right? Just as I got it, we drove on the Michelin and uh, they did a good job. Uh, okay. However, I think a stickier tire would be better. I think we'd get a second and a half increase. Sure. And the second half, that's a big, that's a big deal in, in uh, autocross. Yes, that's correct. So speaking of time, do you have a, a targeted time that you're kind of looking at or is it bad yeah. luck to mention that yet? Or no, yeah, I think I'm happy to speak to it. I, I don't have too many superstitions. Um, I figure that hard work and a great team over, overcomes pretty much any superstition. Um, so basically um, speaking of time, first of all, one of the things that is on the schedule today, if we can fit it in that I'd like to do is Dave has also been generous enough to bring out his 2020 model three that is in complete stock. It's totally stock form. And we are going to take it on the out of spec motor and track to compare it versus what is the lightened R compound. Uh, it's got BC racing coilover suspension, the Carbotec brakes on it. We're going to see what those lap times compare. And because tires are easy to swap, if Dave's up for it and we've got some time, then why not put some R compounds on his stock car so we can kind of identify what it is. And that's, that's the whole, <laughs> that's the leftovers of thank you, Kyle, for lending me those tires. I'll give them back to you. Next thank year. you. They're really <laughs> useful now. I really appreciate that. That was a good bit of fun doing that. Um, it would have happened anyway. Exactly. Uh, but for times of, let's talk target time. So first of all, we're going to take a step back to 2016. Um, when we tested, the Model S is highly capable at about a third of the mountain. So when you go to Pikes Peak, you test a third of the mountain at the time. You never get a chance to run the full course prior to race day. It's part of the... Um, the aura of the event is that you're kind of testing everything in segments and for an internal combustion car, that's not as difficult of a compromise for an electric vehicle. You never get to see the full load of what you're expecting until race day. So if we go back to 2016, my time, when I calculate the model S as best segment times, we were a low 10 minute car. So 1148 was a lot of driver management, bringing the throttle pedal back ultimately to a point where we had optimized the maximum capability over the duration. So 11 minutes and 48 seconds, you know, was plus minus 10 seconds, the optimal perfect run for what the Model S P90 DL, which is the version we had, that's the optimized run for that. The Model 3 in a, what I say a third segment, um, I think the Model 3 will actually not necessarily be faster in the lower third um, if we were con you know, comparing what would be uh, testing times uh, because the Model S has quicker acceleration. Um, the weight of mine, the weights are not that big of a difference between the two cars, surprisingly, uh, once you get them stripped down to weight, you know, kind of race form. And, uh, but it's going to be the middle and upper sections where the the nimbleness and a little bit shorter wheelbase of the Model 3, the ability to rotate it using track mode in the hairpins is going to be huge. Um, the Model S was a lesson in patience and um, late apexing <laughs> um, through the hairpins. With, with the Model 3, we're gonna be able to scoot it into and out of those um, very quickly. And oh, I just wish it was still dirt. It would be so magnificent to just throw some awesome Scandinavian flicks going into those hairpins because I can tell you there's nothing more cool than having a feeling of like, just it's like Monte Carlo in, in the snow, you know, where you're basically, you're facing out over the mountain before you're making the opposing turn. It's just, it's just super cool with this, this weightless feeling when you're floating through there. But anyways, it's paved. Let's get back to the time. Um, the time for me, let's be conservative. I'd like to do an 11 minute and 47 second as a minimum. 
<laughs> that is the goal. Um, the goal is, uh, and and uh, and of course, you, you, you see Zach smiling because Zach goes, "Let's keep in mind the goal here. We got we got to finish, and we have to beat the record." So, yeah. you know, my mind is always going. If you go over the <laughs> down the mountain, like we really, yeah, like, no, it's not good. Yeah, we, we just we yeah, want Dave wants his car time. back. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> not on the ball. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, no, I think um, I think that the Model Three is capable of a mid ten to a high ten minute. Um, there's an interesting mathematical correlation between the quarter mile of a car and what it'll do at Pikes Peak. It, it's it's within about a five percent vector of what you do down a quarter mile in seconds and what it calculates to in minutes at Pikes Peak. It's it's a very just kind of interesting correlation. Um, so. The Model 3 performance yesterday in the form it was, we were running uh, 11.39 in the quarter. Um, but I do think that we'll go quicker than that when it comes to race day. But let's just call it an 11-minute car, and then we'll be pleasantly surprised if we go quicker. So so since you set the record, no one else has taken a Tesla up there? I mean, that's the existing well, record still? Isn't that crazy? And, and you know... Nobody had done it before. So in 2012, I 2012 I was developing a lithium ion battery for the 12 volt system of the P90D. Um, back, if you guys remember, the cars were being delivered, and as they rolled off the flatbed, batteries were dead. <laughs> so they were having a lot of 12 volt battery issues in 2012 right. with Model S. And around that time is when I basically connected with Tesla and started developing a lithium ion solution for the P90D, the dual motor, which was not out yet. And during that time, I started speaking with a lot of the kind of upper management there about putting a program together with Pikes because prior to that, I had one Pikes Peak in the open class, uh, rookie of the year before, and been there multiple times. And I always felt that, you know, having an electric vehicle up there would be amazing. And having done the first ever hybrid race car for Nissan uh, in 2008, I've always been kind of geared up on how do we, you know, disrupt the industry and bring electric motorsports. You know, we want to have electric performance to be something that are synonymous words together. And so um, when we went out with the Model S, it was something that it took me four years to save and to get sponsors and to build a program. I mean, as was being alluded to earlier, I mean, Kyle said, you know, it's a $165,000 car. And then yeah. now it's not like a Porsche cup for 160 grand, you go out and buy and you've got a, a a roll cage in it and you've got some cup tires and coilovers and you've got, oh, I don't know, about a million people who know how to set them up and every race shop in the world is comfortable touching them and, you know, aren't afraid of the fuel burning. But when it came to the Model S, nobody would touch the car as far as putting a cage in it or even working on it without retainers or, you know, some type of uh, insurance waiver. So actually myself and others did the majority of the work on the Model S and we found a shop in Sonoma, which is Kurtz Fabrication, um, just an extremely talented engineer that uh, restores classic Formula One cars and also does some uh, some work for Tesla. So he was comfortable with working on the car. He built a fabulous cage and as, as Jesse was saying, um, it, it's actually, we did a bolting cage because the car was so expensive that we also realized that we still wanted to have the car to be able to daily drive it or take it to show. So, you know, when it was, when we were done with Pike's Peak and some other time attacks, pulled the cage back out, put the leather interior back in, drive the family around, and uh, when the opportunity for Fully Charged came up, I reached out to Dan at uh, Fully Charged and said, hey, I'd like to bring the car out to Dakota. And he's like, yeah, let's rock and roll. So I was like, all right, well, out with the leather seats and with the race cage. <laughs> nice. So, so you ran at, at Circuit of the Americas in yeah. the spring? Oh, awesome. What kind of, did you go for any sort of like a fast touch, fast lap? No, you know, I think I do have some times, but I don't recall them. And when it comes to numbers, unless I'm, like absolutely know it. I don't even want to just throw out a number and be wrong. Um, but I can tell you that it, you know, was quicker than, you know, pretty much anything for three quarters of the track. Right. <laughs> um, and, and some of that though is, is called also, you know, with the group we're with, there was a, a lot of group that's out there that have, that are track day guys that are, that have really capable cars and are, are still getting themselves up to speed with those vehicles. So it's really fun to see, you know, the Model S hustling up behind something like a, you know, McLaren Senna, which was really fun. And if the guy's watching, he actually has a Model 3 and a uh, Taycan as well. So um, 
he he's a super rad dude but was he, that the guy who had the tycon out there yeah yep he was ripping that thing it was great yeah yeah he's um <laughs> man i can't remember his name right now i'm feeling bad i apologize terrible names um but just to give you an idea of the thermal differences is that the model s can do just about one lap of coda so okay. so if you wanted to set a fast lap of coda you would literally have to kind of drive gingerly around and then as you're coming out of the final turn you'd have to give it the go and basically it would be when you're back on that front straight again you're going to start getting some power duration right as you're coming up the hill that's a, it's about one lap whereas i believe the model three will do multiples although i have heard that from that exact same individual the model three uh gets around three or four laps before he feels he's got some power being pulled back from it but at the same time the brakes are going and everything else is going it doesn't pull back a whole lot of power i think on, on the three it just like just kind of keeps it below the, its limit so it'll give you still a lot, a lot of performance but it might take a second or two off your time yeah and, and the limp mode on the model s oh my goodness it it um it, it pulls you down to like 80 kilowatt it's it, it and it's right. interesting the stages that it does it in um because it, we when we first hit that thermal limit it was just like wow party's over go home i mean we've got a we got a mazda miata engine in a 4200 pound car <laughs> so it just it wasn't it wasn't the uh, the way to set a record so when we did pike speak part of the trick was that for the first section we limited the car to about 200 kilowatt so i was um constantly monitoring what what amount of energy we were using and i was keeping it below a 200 kilowatt limit and as we went through the middle section we could bring it to about 250 and then doing small short bursts of between three to 350 coming out of the hairpins, kind of 30 mile an hour to 65 mile an hour, just to kind of get it out of the hole. But then th when you start having more and more aerodynamic limitation, then that's when, you know, you're obviously not going to have as much return on investment. So we would bring it back to about 150 to 200. Um, so I think our average about 200 to 220 going up that, that hill versus the car's capable of 450. So this was a, a P90D, the, yeah, yeah. The, the, new, the new Ravens, are they much better at uh, heat management? From what I've been told, they are better, but I don't know if it's going to be an order of magnitude the way a Model 3 is. Um, I know that I could go quicker in a Raven, absolutely. Um, right. I would say that would be a car that would probably be a 1120, you know, just from all of the watching the data that people have put out and on the forums and so on, I was like, yeah, we can go back with a, with a Raven, which I've got a cage for it, got the setup for it. Um, but for me, it really wanted to, there's so many model three owners out there and it, and it's a car that Tesla is supporting with track mode. I mean, when they launch track mode, I'm yeah. like, Hey, somebody gives a beep about this, right? right. <laughs> Let's go. Yeah, track, track mode's amazing. Cool. Yeah. Go ahead. Sorry. No, no, it's just, I, it's just supporting the community. I mean, once, you know, if, if Tesla's given us track mode, let's take it to the track. <laughs> let's go. Right. So I say, wow. Uh, so, so, There's a lot to talk about. There's a lot we can, we can talk about with all of that stuff in racing. It's a, it's pretty rad. It's pretty amazing. It's like a, so you're looking at like an 11 minutes, you know, but to prepare for that 11 minutes, it takes like a, a ton of resources and money and, and time, like yeah. like hundreds of hours, I think, preparing for this, doing all, all this prep work here? Thousands of Thousands. hours. Yeah. Thousands. I mean, if you really look at it and spread it out among um, the time that's needed and the track you're into even tens of thousands of hours, um, just in the preparation, the planning, um, the logistics, it's yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm personally, I'm, I'm well past a thousand hours already. <laughs> a little plug here right. for Electric Performance Channel. We have a new YouTube channel where we're showing the Road to Pikes Peak, which is a weekly show where Blake is showing what he's doing every week so that the audience can kind of get a behind the scenes on what the community is doing to prepare the car, or what I should say Blake is doing to prepare the car. Um, so, yeah, if you want to tune into that, we've already got like 10 episodes up, uh, and he's showing you everything from, you know, weighing the car to putting in you know, the coilover suspension to how he's doing the data tracking. So it's really, really fun for me because I didn't know any of this stuff. Oh, that's great. I didn't, I didn't even realize you had that. You have 10 episodes up already? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, so man. From the very beginning, I think we're just showing the car getting wrapped recently. And then, you know, we're probably a week or two behind on what we're doing now, but you'll be able to see all the stuff we're, we're doing. 
we need to share that with our own audience here at Inside EVs, I think. That's, that's pretty amazing stuff. So can you, Zach or Jesse, can you tell us just a little bit more about how you're bringing the community into this? Because that's a, an important aspect, I think, of this effort. Yeah, so I mean, when we were kind of uh, looking into what we were trying to do, one of the things was we wanted to put uh, Tesla on the car. We wanted it to be completely obvious what this was. We didn't want to have it covered with a bunch of, uh, you know, massive sponsorship stickers. And you were just like, you know, because when people see a Tesla, sometimes they're just like, what is that, a Buick? You know, they're like, what? <laughs> you know, so we really wanted to put the name on the car. And uh, Tesla was not going to be sponsoring it. Um, and as we're going forward, uh, going through uh, COVID, there's there's like hardly any sponsorship for anything at all. Like it, we're looking for tire sponsorships. There's none. There's no money in the corporate advertising budgets for anything because people just aren't buying stuff. So, um, you know, the idea was going into it that we would definitely want the community involved. And so the idea would be, um, you know, to get your name on the car. So we're selling uh, $200 stickers to put your name on the car to see your name cross the finish line at Pikes Peak. And uh, so that's what we're, that's what we're all about to, to make, you know, it, it's so amazing that a community could actually come in and, and sponsor this vehicle. And, and yeah, we would get put Tesla right on the front, right on the side. Um, yeah. We got like a hundred people so far with their name on the car. Yeah. And that's so cool wow. to see that. Like, you know, like Jesse said, it's not these big corporate names, it's people's names. And right. because that's how important this is. Like this is different. I, I just get this feeling like this is different than any other time. People who enjoy EVs really feel it. They feel this passion for let's share this with the world because the whole idea behind this car, I mean, I'm not really into racing, although I, I think I've caught the bug. Um, but it's it's showing what these cars can do because it. I really think very quickly we're going to show all the motorheads out there, all the ice car heads, uh, that this is the car of the future. And, and I have to say too, I mean, I I'm proud to be the person that's the first one to do this with a Model Three going up Pikes Peak, but it's very difficult uh, and it's it's a challenge. I, I I'm encouraging others that you know, and that's part of this networking is that if anybody is out doing Tesla Corsa or others that have uh, done a lot of track events that have knowledge to share, you know, please reach out to us so we can share it with the community because that's one of the reasons that manufacturers like Porsche and BMW have been so successful for so many years, Corvette as well, is it's the, the community knowledge, right? So our community right now is able to contribute monetarily and overcome what is gosh 20 25,000 dollar cost for tires you know um ten thousand dollars to just get the team there and to be able to support the car these are the community is able to help the dollars wise but what happens is we're able to give back with the knowledge of now hey i just bought a model 3 performance and i'm not blake fuller and the electric performance team but i want to go and i want to run at my local racetrack, or I want to go to my local autocross. What what setup do I use? You know, um, how do how do I how do I get out there and be competitive? How do I be safe? Right? How do I have more fun for a longer period? Because that's really the, the core of it for me is that these cars are fun. How do we stretch that fun window to a longer time period? My Model S is a hell of a lot of fun for thirty seconds to three minutes, depending on you know what the conditions are, but. If I were to go buy an internal combustion car, you know, I'm sad to say that I could go drive for an hour and have fun. So we want to get that gap to close. And that's part of this whole effort is how to get it so we can go out and more people can do what they enjoy doing at racetracks, but do it in, in a more sustainable manner. And also something that as they're driving to and from the track, it's also something that is just a better overall vehicle. I mean, it, I have to speak to one point and that is that we do have so much less maintenance with our cars. It's just amazing to not have to worry about every other track day worrying about, okay, I need to change the oil again, or I need to be checking this particular fluid, or I'll, I'm going to go to the track and it's going to cost me $300 in race fuel. So while Tesla is not officially sponsoring us, thanks to free supercharging, thanks to Dave, um, you know, at least they're, they're paying for our race fuel. <laughs> Well, and another point here is, you know, you know, Blake talks a lot about the the racing aspect of it and like, you know, people who could actually go race. Um, but I think that another aspect of it when we're talking about EV adoption is just this idea that um, when you have a family 
whoever is the most knowledgeable about cars is generally going to be involved in most of the car buying decisions for that family. And so that person is going to be turned to and say, what car should we buy? And whatever, and people who are generally into cars are generally into racing. It's a very general term, but um, mm-hmm. the top performing and and the aspirational cars, you know, for for the longest time, Corvettes, Lamborghinis, Ferrari, you know, you're thinking something like that. Um, and so that's pushed people to being like, you know, oh, I want a bigger engine, I want more power, um, and and. Now we can actually be having the aspirational car be a Tesla Model 3, um, a performance that's going up the hill, but you can get a standard range. We just talked about how the price dropped. Um, it's a, a so much more approachable car. And so for those people who are the car buyers of a, of a, of a, of a household, um, it's, it's really transformative to have them see a vehicle that they could go purchase for someone in their family um, or, or to advise someone in their family to go purchase, um, that's going to make a transformational change. And that's one of the reasons why, like, I'm just so happy to see, um, you know, the Porsche Taycan and all of these other, you know, sort of unattainable, very expensive EVs that have high performance because it kind of shows like electric cars are not golf carts anymore. Yeah, they, that, that needs to put the rest. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and Jesse, Jesse's got a good point there too, because as Kyle and I have both instructed for BMW with their performance center and also doing facilitation for the launch of model, the, I said model, sorry, for the three series, um, for the three series cars, we see it all the time where um, the decision influencer within the, within a group, a community, I mean, it could be one person who went and did the experience in an in a M3, not the Model 3, but BMW M3, and were blown away, that passion spread to where now other people in their community were buying a 320 or a 330, the, or even you know now a 2 Series, right? So it, it, it has a trickle-down effect into the purchasing decision to where it's the knowledge maker tells everybody, and it's also acceptable and cool, but they've actually gotten the real you know, sense of, hey, these cars as a chassis, as a, as a company, are creating great products. So if I can only afford the entry level, I'm still getting something that's quality with my money. And that's that's what people want to buy. Wow. It's, it's going to be an amazing week. That's, and that's the other thing with Pikes Peak. It's like over a, a whole year there for a whole week. It's like 10 minutes of run, but you're there. <laughs> and you're sleeping, what, maybe four hours a day, probably, if you're lucky. Yeah, that's it. If, if I hope I get that last, last time I was so thankful. I had such a great crew um, of volunteers and a few people that because they had to take off work, they had to have some compensation. Um, I actually did get some sleep. Uh, but, you know, when I was out there the first couple of years, just myself and three or four other people, it was about an hour of sleep a night. So, so if you want to add the recipe of what's stupidity, it's um, get no sleep. Come from Florida to Colorado to where you have oxygen deprivation. Right. Then drive a car ridiculously fast up a hill that you wrenched on while you were also tired, and then try to set a record. That that just yeah. For being logical. You have a second thoughts there, Dave? <laughs> no, heck no. Are you kidding? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I get a cat nap. I'm good. <laughs> yeah, that's it. It's just amazing. I'm I just being the- for a couple of days and Thank getting you. caught up in that. Oh, sorry, I'm talking over somebody. Go ahead. Dom, one of the things I wanted to add, one of the things that I think it's important to point out is the guys were talking about one of the reasons why they want to do this is to show that electric vehicles are capable and they're fun and and so forth. We'd be remiss not to point out that the overall Pikes Peak record right now is held by an electric vehicle, the Volkswagen IDR. Um, You know, did it a couple years ago, I think, at – seven, a little under eight, eight minutes, 7.57 seconds, something like that. So, I mean, you know, electric cars are here. They're, 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 they're proving time and time again, their performance is better than ice. And uh, I'm looking forward to seeing uh, Blake set a new uh, production record uh, for electric vehicles. And, uh, 
you know, a little disappointed he didn't say he was shooting for the 757, but I guess he's a little more rooted in reality than I am. We'll have to see if we can find the budget to send you out there, Tom. I've been there once already, so it's your turn. You'll, you'll, you'll love it. You can get eat donuts at the uh, little, there's a little cabin at the very top of the uh, of the mountain and i think they have like a i think they might have renovated it recently but yeah they may, they make donuts there and it's like a, a thing you line up for donuts and yeah, yeah i've never been but looking forward <laughs> you, you, you are missing a uh, it's a bucket list item and then some yeah fingers crossed so uh so before we wrap up to any anything anybody else want to mention anything else about this project I had a, a, a quick question. Isn't there some rule about uh, EVs being not too quiet for Pike's Peak? But yeah. uh, isn't there a minute, like because you scare off the animals and people who can't hear you coming? How do you um, how do you how do you get around the fact that there's no noise with electric cars doing these these yeah. runs? What what do you, how do you get around that? Some sort of an alert system or something? Yeah. So the, that's a good question. Um, it is it's a spectator event that have really not too many grandstands and no real roping. So, you know, when that's part of the Pikes Peak Allure is you can, you can grab your cooler and your chair and you can sit right on the side of the racetrack. Right. And so sometimes because the cars do not all run at one time, they, they space them out so that one car does not hold another one up. When cars aren't running, that's when people are like, Oh, my friend's over there and they've got a drink for me or, Oh man, I forgot something in the car and they go to walk across. Right. And in 2000, when I ran an Acura Integra Type R in showroom stock class, because it was showroom stock, the exhaust was not as loud as some of the traditional V8s, and nobody heard me coming. So there was a couple of times where people were walking by with their coolers that I almost hit them. Um, so when electric started coming, they actually require us to put a, an audible alarm that has to be 120 decibels metered from, three, from one meter. So... Um, the challenge, and, and in 2016, we tried to pull this together. We worked with um, the uh, Maryland State University. We also worked with Klipsch Audio. We were trying to do an audio replication of the sound and make it loud enough. Um, but because of just timing constraints, we couldn't get the system operable enough for tech inspection to say, yes, we're good to go. So we ended up running a really annoying siren. Um, thanks to the installation of the Model S, I couldn't hear it too loud inside. <laughs> um, but yeah, we have to run a we have to run an audible alert going up, which um, it, it's a safety thing, but it kind of detracts from the uh, the sound. I will tell you that the electric vehicles sound absolutely amazing inside, and even the Model Three, it's something that once you've removed the interior, it it's just really great to hear the electric motors. It, it's it, it's not an unpleasant sound whatsoever. So you say you, you, you're running a siren or, or you can put any kind of a sound? You could have like goats? <laughs> or fart <laughs> noises as we go up? <laughs> <laughs> I guess there's not too many goats on Pike's Peak, but I was thinking we might, you know, we don't want to do mating calls because that might be dangerous. <laughs> there are wild animals up there. That's but, you know, I like the wild animal idea. I think we should go with something that, that makes sure that the groundhogs don't run across because that's the other challenge. I mean, I've had it where, like, you're coming up and groundhogs start running across and then, you know, that's that squirrel effect, right? <laughs> like, you don't right. want to when you're doing 100 miles an hour with a 3,000 foot cliff. <laughs> Maybe like a bird of prey sound. I, do some research and get back to me on that one. I, I want to think, yeah. I think a good old AC <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Highway to hell. to leave the subwoofer in the car <laughs> and we could just be blasting something. Um, I mean, that's what I do and people generally get out of the way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's that easy again. <laughs> ACDC would be kind of poetic, you know, and it's on exactly. <laughs> All right. Uh, anybody, anybody want to add anything else? Oh, there's, there's always tons to add, but I think uh, we'll, we'll, we'll part and parcel it. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, this brings us to the end of our show then, and I'd like to thank you all for joining us. It was kind of a surprise. We weren't uh, really planning on having guests for a while, but this opportunity came up, and it's like, yes. <laughs> and so and it's great to learn about this and the uh the, what's what's that tell us about that channel again the new channel again uh zach electric performance so yeah it's a youtube channel and uh feel free to go over there and subscribe and check out the videos we've got a new one every week showing what blake is doing to the car so you can get behind the scenes look at what it takes to run a race car 
Yeah, we just got a ton of great footage yesterday, and we yeah, expect and to get some great Thank you to Kyle today. for telling us this little trick where you can lay in the back of his smart car. <laughs> backwards. Uh, out the trunk. Backwards out the trunk and just have your feet strapped in with some uh, seat belts. Seat belts. That, <laughs> it's real Jesse safe. said, hey, let's do it again. This time have Kyle drive you. And I'm right. like, no. do, oh, you, no. do you love me, son? <laughs> I said you could have, I said I would go and I would lay back there. Oh, okay. You know. All right, then let's do it. Hey, that's let's worth start. money. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Right on. Well, okay. Thank well, thank you all for joining us. And if you have any comments about any of the topics on today's show or this project, you can comment on the Inside EVs podcast post on Inside EVs, um, or on the Inside EVs forum podcast thread. And don't forget, you can follow our panelists on Twitter. Uh, Tom is at Tomalog, Martin is at EV News Daily, and Kyle is at Out of Spec. I'm Dominic underscore Y, and uh, Blake, uh, where, can, where can people find you? So I I need to be a bit more social active on Twitter and so on, but I think the best way to follow what we're doing is the Electric Performance channel. Uh, and then also we have my Patreon, which is Patreon forward slash Blake Fuller. And that's an area where as we move along, we're going to, we've been condensing what is really hours of quality footage into five to 20 minute digestible segments for the channel. So it's on the Patreon that we're going to start putting a lot of the behind the scenes and additional data. It's taking a long time to get all of that compiled to, as you might imagine, as with COVID up until this point, the vehicle has been kind of unilaterally been worked on by myself. So we're not exactly on schedule with all the stuff we're trying to get up, but that is a great place that if they can support not only the efforts of what we're doing, but it's where we're going to be adding a lot more of the uh, data details and things that might be a little bit too much for just a, a short, uh, short stint. Um, and the other thing too, is that with, with the entire program, there are th three things that we definitely would love some assistance from people on. One is anybody who's done track events before with setup, and the other is the can side of items, uh, data logging or any type of, you know, wink, wink, inside secrets about the cooling system or the drive system that we would have to learn through trial and error that can help accelerate us. That would be just wonderful for the community to help us there. And then, you know, finally, as has been talked about, because of the, the building of this program, there's an opportunity for people to be able to support it by getting their name on the car, which I am just, I, I'm, I'm, yeah, speechless with the number of people that support it. Something that I I wanted to occur, but I didn't think it would be so wildly popular. And I'm just so thankful for everybody doing this. Yeah, it's great to hear you got so much participation already, and uh, hopefully some. Hopefully, we'll help help you get the word out, so we, you'll get some more. Uh, Evie Dave, are you on social media at all? I am. Uh, I can be reached as Evie Dave on Twitter, and also YouTube is Evie Dave uh, channel there. Awesome. I'll we'll have to take a look for that. And uh, Zach and Jesse, of course, want to give us your other channel name and details or Twitter handles? Yeah, you can check us out on Now You Know channel on YouTube. We do a weekly show on Tesla. We've been going almost four years straight. We're about to hit episode 200 soon, uh, every wow. week for 200 weeks. Uh, and now, so Tesla Time News on Mondays and uh, in depth on Fridays. And uh, our Twitter is NYK channel on Twitter. Awesome. Well, thank you very much for joining us. We really appreciate it. And best of luck on the mountain. Yeah. And uh, yeah, we'll look forward to that. And we'll, I guess we'll be talking about that on the website as well. Uh, have a great and oh, a special shout out to our, our viewers, our live viewers. So they've been throwing up messages here and there. And we really appreciate you joining us. And uh, we'll see you all again next week. Yes.